music, the mystery of music, what Nietzsche called so rightly the mysterium tremendum, the mysterium tremendum of the last act of Tristan, and many other cases, many other cases. It can be an etude of Chopin, it can be a phrase almost in Mozart, speaks to us that there is something else which paradoxically belongs to us profoundly but somehow touches on a universal meaning and possibility. That we are not only an electrochemical and neurophysiological assemblage. That there is more in consciousness than electronic wiring. Music seems to me more than literature. The great force, the hope of a transcendent possibility. That is why it is so vitally important that our children be given access at the earliest time to good music. I sound like a boring old reactionary, I don't apologize. <laughs> Nothing frightens me more than the withdrawal of serious music from the lives of millions of young children. The replacement of many forms of music by the horror of organized noise, by the barbarism of organized noise, the deafening folly of not letting a child encounter good music, of not teaching it an instrument, if possible, of not teaching it to sing, if possible. There was a time in daily life, in 19th and early 20th century Europe, when an amateur performance was a natural attainment of educated people. It needn't be very good, it needn't be very great, but it was part of a coming together and of being in touch with that mysterium tremendum of the transcendental. If they take that away from us, we are indeed in very deep trouble. But I don't think they will be able to. During the worst periods of despotism and tyranny, people could learn musical scores by heart. Even where music was forbidden, they could still commit it to memory. Music is very difficult to censor. Yes, it can be stopped, it can be suppressed, musicians can be hunted and hounded and tortured, but still, it is there. And always its strange mystery remains. The Concertgebouw is a place in which to remember the last concerts of that very ambiguous genius, Furtwängler. The lights went out regularly, and we have recordings where you hear the gunfire of the Russian artillery approaching Berlin. And Furtwängler's Beethoven, and one Haydn recording at that time, played in the dark, the people in the audience knowing they were doomed, knowing they were doomed into a horrible fate. And there are no greater recordings or readings of that music known to me than those. There is something in the music which is much stronger even than our greatest performers. The music, in a sense, plays us. We are played by it. That does not mean that there will be agreement on its meanings. That does not mean that we will not continue to debate fiercely about the choice of a slow movement from a Bruckner symphony to mark the death of the Führer. We have a recording, and it too is fantastic. It's one of the very great recordings. For many, many years, I was trying to understand why music does not say no at certain occasions. 
Dachau, as you know, is just outside Munich, just outside. And the trains with the people in them dying of thirst and hunger on the way to Dachau used to pass not far at all from the great music hall. In that hall, Giza King was giving his Debussy cycle, and good judges say that there's never been a greater interpretation of Debussy. And my question was to German students, and I began asking it immediately after the war, to German school children, why did the music not say no? Which is a nonsense question. But is it a nonsense question? I still don't know the answer. Could the music have refused to be played? Of course it could. Could it have been played wrong at least? Could Giza King have played wrong notes at least? Didn't. So the mystery remains. But so, but so does the strong, urgent hope that we will not let them take away from us that overwhelming experience, that privilege of being, which is great music. I thank you.